From the University of Arizona Distance Learning Program, this is Optical Sciences 505, Diffraction and Interferometry, with Dr. James Wyant. This broadcast is authorized by the Arizona Board of Regents on behalf of the University of Arizona. Any reproduction or retransmission of this course or use of same for granting of credit without the express written consent of the University of Arizona is strictly prohibited. Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. It's nice to have sunshine back here in Tucson again after a few days of uh, not such nice weather. Of course, probably some of the people watching us on TV would have thought that weather we had the last few days was pretty nice, but to us it was pretty, pretty bad, I guess. Anyway, um, last class we were talking about, end of the class, talking about fringe localization. So let's start there again and um, see if we can determine where fringes are going to be localized. By that mean, we mean where do we have to look in space to see the interference fringes? And I think right at the end of the last class, we, uh, we said that we can use the um, Van Sittert Zernike theorem to help us find where the fringes are localized. And I think the equation we had right at the end of class just wrote down the, the Van Sittert Zernike theorem. And I'm sure at least four or five of you were dreaming about it last night. Um, is that true? No, oh, maybe it's not true. Well, tonight you will. <laughs> or at least tonight before the first exam you will. How's that? Anyway, uh, we wrote here we're interested in the uh, spatial coherence in this case. So gamma 1, 2, and we'll take the magnitude of that, is given by the normalized Fourier transform of the source distribution. And so we're sitting at where these two points are that we're trying to find the coherence between. The two points are separated by a distance x in the x direction and y in the y direction. And if we look back towards the source, things in the source area are expressed in terms of alpha. We're looking at uh, source coordinates in terms of the uh, angular, angular coordinates. And so like alpha sub x would be squiggle over L, or my next drawing. L is what we used last class. My next drawing, I'll show the distance from the two points we are to the source is R. So it would be squiggle over R, and alpha sub y is eta over L or, or R. OK, so now. Let's go to a drawing. And I gave you a handout today. And uh, those of you out in TV land, I guess we'll have to, uh, we'll have to wait for this. But it's, it's in the mail. Uh, this is an old paper that I wrote 20 years ago talking about fringe localization. And there's a little figure there, which you probably can't see. You don't need to zoom in, because I have a big one of it right here. And so now what we're going to do is these are the two points where we're, we want to find the coherence between these two points. And we will uh, go over here to where the source is. And for my drawing, that's a distance r away. Or for last class, we called it l. And we're going to say that from this space here, as we look out here, the separation between the points will go as some angle theta. So theta is just distance here divided by L. You have theta in x direction, and you have theta sub y in the y direction. And so we can go back to our previous expression here. And we could write this, that alpha sub x times x is equal to squiggle over L times x. And so that's equal to squiggle times theta sub x. And we would have a similar question for a similar result for theta sub y. So now we can take this and plug it back up into our expression up here for the coherence function. <clears throat> and now I will go to the paper here. And now if we could get this out of the way, if we could zoom in on this equation right there. And uh, at least those in the class have it, um, those of you are watching it on TV or getting it, that we have just rewritten this coherence function as i of x prime, y prime. So that's the source in this 
in this case, the source coordinates I use for this paper are x prime, y prime. And uh, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda, theta sub x times x prime plus theta sub y, y prime, dx prime, dy prime. And down here, we just integrate over the whole source, i of x prime, y prime, dx prime, dy prime. So this is our coherence function expressed in terms of angles um, of the rays leaving the source. Okay, These thetas, we can think back here. Now I have to we'll practice the zoom here this morning. Um, theta here, we're sitting back here, and theta would be the angle between coordinates here. You think of rays leaving the source, and theta is the angle between these rays. Okay, now we have to zoom again. I'm sorry about this, but keeping you awake out there this morning. Um, so this coherence function, now we, we say here, when will this be a maxima? And if we go to this... Um, I hate to say it, we go to Gaskell's course. I, I, I was young and foolish when I wrote this paper and I actually referenced Gaskell's paper, or his book here. But uh, actually, it's a very good book. We won't tell him that I said that, but I better erase this part of the tape maybe. When I said that. But in any case, um, the central ordinate theorem, I think you've heard of. And so, how many of you have heard of that? Yeah, okay. And so this is going to be a maxima here when these thetas are equal to zero. Independent of what the source distribution is, this will become a maximum when the thetas are equal to zero. Now, what in the world does that mean, and how is that related to fringe localization? Well, one way of thinking about that is what that is saying is that we're going to get maximum fringe contrast when a ray interferes with another ray, leaving the source at almost the same angle as the first ray. In fact, we get the best contrast when a ray interferes with itself, okay? Because we want theta to be zero. And so whatever this complex interferometer is that we have, you know, you, you take uh, uh, your source and you trace a ray in from your source and you see coming out of the interferometer, if it's two beam interferometer, for every ray going in, you're gonna have two rays coming out. And the best contrast fringes will be when these two rays uh, intersect because that's when a ray you know is is interfering with itself and so there are, you know there are a lot of a lot of complex derivations for where the fringes are localized and the, the complex derivations always end up with this result that you the ray you get the best contrast fringes where the rays intersect with themselves okay now let's say I have a point source here so i of x, y is a delta function. Well, now, uh, Fourier transformer delta function is just a constant here. So now it doesn't matter if a ray interferes with itself or not. And so if we have a point source, the fringes are not localized. They exist every place the two interfering beams overlap. With an extended source, the fringes are localized. And sometimes we'll see they're localized at infinity, or sometimes they're localized near a mirror or someplace. But they're going to be localized where, you know, you, you take a single ray, trace it through the system, you get two rays out. Where these two rays intersect will be where the fringes are best localized. Now, if this region where the two rays intersect, if that depends upon which ray you took going into the interferometer, then probably you're not going to have any place where the fringes are localized very well because different rays from the source are going to give you good contrast fringes at a different location depending on which ray you pick. Well, this is, is pretty powerful, although I'm sure you don't appreciate it yet. But uh, as we go through and we'll look at various interferometers, you'll see how this comes into play. And uh, that will be in the next chapter. We have one more thing to cover in this chapter first. but. Once we get to the next chapter, we'll begin to see how this, how this uh, really helps us in determining where fringes are localized, where we should look for the interference fringes. So I'd ask you if you have any questions, but I'm sure you have lots of questions. And I, I think what we should do is wait till we get about halfway through chapter six, and then we'll see if you still have questions on this. And then we, if you do, then we can discuss it in more detail. 
But before we go on to chapter 6, we have one more item that we want to discuss here. And this is a uh, so-called intensity interferometer. And this is 5.6 intensity interferometer. Sometimes called correlation interferometry. Okay. Or sometimes called the Hanbury Brown twist interferometer. And before I go into this, I'm going to go back in just a little bit and review something. I can find it in my notes here real fast. I'm going to go back to the Michelson Stellar interferometer. Okay. And let's talk about that just a second here. Remember what we did in the Michelson Stellar? What was it we were looking at out here, remember? Basketball team? No? Two basketballs, maybe. We're looking at um, uh, binary stars was one example we looked at here. And we said that, you know, we get some fringes here that depend upon the angle between the two beams. And here we're picking off two portions of the wavefront. And whether we get good contrast fringes or not here depends upon the coherence function, uh, uh, coherence between light here and light here. And we said that, say, we have binary stars out here. As we vary the separation here, the fringe contrast here went as the Fourier transform of the source, so it went as a cosine function. And if we come out here to some particular location, the fringe contrast will go to zero. And by knowing the location of the separation here and the wavelength, we could calculate the separation between the binary stars. Remember that now? Well, I didn't say much about it at the time, but these little areas here, little slits or mirrors, really, are kept fairly small. And the problem is, if you make it too large, you have atmospheric turbulence. And the atmosphere will cause a wavefront phase variation across the wavefront here and a phase variation across the wavefront down here. And that, when the beams interfere to produce fringes, uh, that's going to, depending on the phase variation, that's going to shift the position of the fringes and will tend to wash out the fringes. So you're going to get a fringe reduction, fringe contrast reduction, due to atmospheric turbulence here. And so you keep these mirrors small. You keep them maybe, well, a typical number is 10 centimeters, 4 inches or smaller, to reduce the effects of atmospheric turbulence. Okay? So that's a little limitation here with the Michelson Stellar interferometer. Okay, let's go ahead here and talk about this great thing called the Hanbury Brown Twist interferometer. Now, back when I was a student, this was a very hot topic. And you could be sure on your prelims, you would be asked something on the Hanbury Brown twist experiment. And so you always studied the theory to this very carefully. And I survived all that. But the funny thing is, once I got out of college a few years, it took me a while to realize that this was a dash here, not a comma. It's actually Hanbury Brown twist actually are two people not three people. So I just want to make sure you understand this is two people, not three people. Don't make the mistake that I made. Okay. This is a, it's a, it's an amazing, very amazing thing. And I'll give you a reference on this. And um, Fransone's book on optical interferometry, I think I, probably the first day of class, I made some nasty comments on it, saying I don't like it. Well, there's one thing in this book that is extremely well written, I think. And that's this portion right here. And it's about page uh, 181. 
And so um, I don't know that you need to look at it for this course, but if in the future you ever get involved in this uh, intensity interferometer, I would encourage you to, to go to, to Franzone's book. Well, what we're going to say here is that, um, well, we're going to try to use this so-called intensity interferometer to look at, say, binary stars and do the same thing we did with the Michelson stellar interferometer. And kind of the idea is the following, that, you know, the, the electric field is some E naught of T uh, cosine of phi of T um, plus omega of 2 bar nu bar, uh, 2 pi nu bar times T. And when we are looking at the Michelson stellar interferometer, what we're really looking is how this phase varies and looking at the uh, correlation uh, phase uh, due to the phase changes. But the idea here is that maybe if instead of just looking at the phases, maybe if we look at the intensities and look at how the, in the intensity must be varying too, maybe some way by looking at the intensity we can, um, or amplitudes here, maybe we can also determine the coherence function. And that's precisely what Hanbury, Brown, and Twist did. And so we'll, we're going to build a telescope here right now. We're going to build two telescopes. And the interesting thing about these two telescopes here is that while in the Michelson interferometer, we had to have very high quality telescopes, and we had to have small apertures because of atmospheric turbulence, here we're not going to be in interested in the phase at all. So these telescopes can be really lousy telescopes. They're really going to be light buckets, okay? And we're going to take this and we're going to focus the light down in these two telescopes. And uh, back in the days when Hambray Brown and did, did this, they used PMTs, photomultiplier tubes. And even today you might do that because you're going to work with some pretty low uh, light levels. Anyway. We have two detectors here. And um, coming out of here, just we have a couple of amplifiers. I guess really just emphasizing that we, we don't have a lot of uh, energy here that we're working with. So these are two amplifiers. And then we're going to take these two outputs. And one of these we're going to send through a a time delay, okay, and um, the other one we won't send through a time delay, and um, we're going to then put in something that will multiply the two signals, so M is multiplication. And we have some output here. Okay. So these are going to be placed many, many meters apart. They're going to be large, essentially just light buckets, not, not high quality at all. And we're just going to take the two signals out, going to multiply the two signals, and enable a time delay in one of the paths, one of the uh, arms here. So what is all this going to give us? Well, before I write that down, I need a sip of my medicine. Okay. Well, let's just write down the coherence function, kind of remember what that was. And this is uh, the non-normalized one. Um, gamma 1, 2 of tau. That's the time average of E1 of T e2 star of t plus tau. Now what we're looking at in this instrument here is not the electric field, but we're looking at the intensity or irradiance, if you like. So what we have here is from one telescope, we have some I1 of t. In the other telescope, we have I2 of t plus tau. And we're multiplying these two, and we're doing a time average. And so that time average here, well, I'll write it down here, it's going to be long, is going to be 
E1 of T, E1 complex conjugate of T, okay, times E2 of T plus tau, E2 complex conjugate of T plus tau, time average. So we have one, two, three, four here. So this is a correlation of fourth order. Okay. Now I have one of my favorite lines. It can be shown. I don't want to go through it here. I don't want to take the time to go through it, but I'll give you the the reference, just you can go to Franzone's book and he uh, does it for you. It can be shown that I1 of t, I2 of t plus tau, time average, is I1, I2, average. So these are, well, I should say mean, these mean values. Um, plus the magnitude of gamma 1, 2 of tau squared. So if you go to Franzone's book, you can go through that little derivation to see if this is true. Okay, now, so we will take that. Now I'm going to write that delta I1 of t is whatever I1 of t is minus the average of the mean value. So this is just saying we're, we're varying about the mean. And so I just you know, subtract out the mean, and that gives me my delta. And we'll, we can do the same thing for I2, but I'll write it down. Delta I2 of t is um, I2 of t minus average, uh, minus the mean value. Okay. And maybe the last thing I can write on this sheet of paper is that delta, by definition, delta I1 of t, the average value of that, just by definition, is equal to zero. And the same thing for delta I2 of t. Okay. Slide that up here. Therefore, I1 of t, I2 of t plus tau, time average of that, is I1 average plus uh, delta uh, I1 of t. times I2 average plus delta I2 of T plus tau. Okay, so I just plugged in from up above I1 and I2. Multiplying this out, we would get I1 average, I2 average, then the cross terms are going to cancel out because the average value of delta I1 and delta I2 be equal to zero. And so we'll get plus here delta I1 of T, um, delta I2 of T plus tau. And so therefore, from slide this down for a second, from this thing where we said it can be shown in Franzone's book. We have that the variations time average of delta I1 of t, delta I2 of t plus tau is gamma 1, 2 of tau squared. 
or if I'll rewrite this uh, in normalized uh, coherence function here, that uh, delta I1 of t, delta I2 of t plus tau, time average, um, is equal to I1 average, I2 average, little gamma, 1, 2 of tau. So we have the result here that simply by looking at intensities, we don't have to take into account phase, we don't have to um, look at interference fringes, but just taking into account intensities and finding the time average of the variations in the intensities falling on these two telescopes, we can calculate the coherence function. And when Hanbury, Brown, and Twist showed this, I mean, there are a lot of people who almost couldn't believe it. But it, they built a, an enormous system down in the outback in Australia, and it worked. worked very well. The, the one limitation to this, well, the good thing is, and then I'll get to the limitation. The good thing is we don't have to have good telescopes. Uh, they're just light buckets. We can make them very large, so we can collect a lot of light. But the bad news is that this correlation is proportional to the square of the intensity. So correlation proportional to square of intensity. Therefore, it's limited to bright stars. The atmospheric turbulence has very little effect on the measurement at all. Um, but the real limitation is that it works only with bright stars. Is there a question? Or? Yeah. Um, uh, from your first line on that to your second line, what happens to your cross terms in there? The, the thing is that the average of delta I1 of t is equal to 0. The average of delta I2 two of t is equal to 0. And so when we do the cross terms, delta I1 of t average times I2 average, that's going to drop out to 0. And the same thing for the other one. Any other questions? Okay, well, it's a neat, it's a very neat device here, but uh, we, need to, we need to go on. Okay. So we, that finishes everything I was going to cover on coherence. And so you all feel like you're experts in coherence? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you another week. Okay. Chapter 6 is classical two-beam in interferometers. So we're going to look at 101, well, maybe not quite, several interferometers here. Try to get an idea as to how they, how they work. And the first one, 6.1 is called fringes with a plane parallel plate. Can't get much simpler than that for an interferometer. And that's going to be broken into a few subsections here. 6.1.1 is a point source. Okay, you can probably guess what 6.1.2 is. Okay, and what I think I'll do here, since my drawing is so bad, even for a simple thing like this, that I will cheat, and I will go to the, uh, the view graphs, which I don't know if anyone brought them with you or not, but this is um, section four of these, of these view graphs. And uh, well, this one isn't too hard to draw without having a few graphics. It's plane parallel plate, so we have two lines here. Refractive uh, index here of, of something or another, say n. 
we have a point source up here. And I just draw a normal from that point source to this surface here. That's my normal. We have light coming here. Uh, well, light coming here. Some of the light will be reflected off the first surface and back here. And we're just going to look at some point P right there. And some light will be coming, well, transmit through the first surface and be reflected from the second surface and come out here. And again, we're looking at the interference fringes here. And a few things we can say right away. We can go back to my old favorite Van Sitter at Zernike theorem and say, well, where are the fringes localized? Point source. Fourier transform point source, I guess we got a constant. You know, the secret's written right here. They're non-localized, right? They exist every place. So we're going to have fringes here every place the two beams overlap. Okay? Non-localized fringes, we'll say. Then the other thing, and I guess I give the answer down here, but just because of symmetry, if I were to put a plane up here in space, because of symmetry, but the fringes have to be circular, right? No reason for them not to be circular. And they would be circular with a center about this normal right here. Okay. So that's about all there is to say about it. They're going to be centered along here. So if I had a plane because, you know, just because of symmetry, that's the way they'd be. If I had a plane here, there would be circular with the center of the circles along this line, where this line intersects my plane. We don't need to do any math to show that. We could, but we don't, don't need to. Just because of symmetry, that's where they have to be and what the shape has to be. Okay. Now, any other questions? Well, not. Let me ask you a question. What will happen as I take this point source and move it around? The fringes are going to move around. Okay. What if instead of having a little point source here, if I have an extended, incoherent point source? Well, each point on that extended, incoherent point source will produce a set of fringes. And probably, as this source gets large enough, these fringes are going to wash out, or tend to wash out. OK, so that takes us to section 6.1.2, which is called extended source. So plane parallel plate, extended source. And we're going to break this into subsections here. And the first one is 6.1.2.1. And that's going to be for reflected light. And again, you can probably guess what 6.1.2.2 is going to be. And so I will also bring up a, a drawing here so I don't have to do it myself. And we'll first just kind of um, cover up a portion here. I definitely want to cover up the answer. OK. So here's our, our uh, plane parallel plate. So we have a source up here. And it's going to become an extended source. But right now, I'm just looking at one point on that source. And we're saying the refractive index outside here is n prime. Inside is n. And um, probably take n prime over here, although we won't use that right now. The light comes down here. We have a normal. So light leaves at an angle, uh, I mean, instant here, an angle theta prime. And some of the light will be reflected up here. And some of the light will come into this plate being at an angle of theta okay, to the normal. Come down here to the second surface, be reflected here, and we'll come back here 
these two surfaces are parallel and so the light from this one ray will come out as two rays that are parallel with respect to each other. Extended source. So where do I, where will the fringes be localized? Well, let's see, we said from the Van Zernike theorem, we trace one ray in, we get two rays out, and it's where these two rays intersect is where the fringes are going to be localized. That's where we have to look to see the fringes. These two rays are parallel to one another. So where do they intersect? At infinity, right. So the fringes are going to be localized at infinity. My lab is too small to, to find the fringes at infinity, so I put in a lens here and focus down the lens. And where do we look here? At the focal plane of the lens, okay? So we're going to look at fringes in the focal plane equivalent to looking at fringes localized at infinity. So now the question is, well, one, of the, one of the many questions is, uh, what's the path difference between these two rays? How does that path difference depend on angle, refractive index, thickness of the plate, and so on? And so there's a little derivation here, very straightforward, but it gives a result that is sort of amazing, actually. I could make money right now betting with you, I think, on what the result would be. What worries me, even after going through this, I could probably make money betting. It's a result that is strange. But let's go through this. It's not, I mean, it's not hard. There's nothing difficult here. What's the path difference between the two? Well, this one guy is AB plus BC. So here we've gone, we've drawn a normal to, the, to these two rays leaving here. So one path is AB plus BC, and that has a refractive index of N. So the optical path length for that is AB plus CB times n. And we have to subtract from that the other path for the other ray, and that's just AD. And outside here, we have a refractive index of n prime. So that's our result. Delta L is AB plus CB times n minus n prime times AD. Now we want to play with that a little bit to get it in the form that we normally see it. First off, we note that AB is equal to BC. Uh, which is equal to D, the separation here, divided by the cosine of this angle inside. Okay? So AB is equal to CB is D over cosine theta. AD is equal to AC times the sine of theta prime. This is a theta prime here, and so this angle right here, so this is normal to these beam. So this angle right here is also theta prime. So AD is AC sine theta prime. AC here is 2D tangent of the angle inside. So this, this angle here is theta um, inside here. And so um, AC is simply 2D tangent theta. And so just plugging that back in here, we'd have AD is 2D tangent theta sine theta. Okay? Then we go to Snell's law. N prime sine theta prime is N sine theta. And so solving for delta L here, we would have that delta L is up here, 2nd cosine theta minus 2n prime d sine theta over cosine theta times n sine theta over n prime. Okay, so the first part here is just 2nd over cosine theta. Second part is minus 2n prime d sine theta divided by cosine theta n sine theta divided by n prime. Multiplying this out, 2nd over cosine theta times 1 minus sine squared theta. And so, of course, the 
answer here is that delta L is 2 nd cosine theta. So kind of the amazing thing is, the surprising thing, I guess, I don't know if I say amazing, the surprising thing is that as this angle becomes larger, and these paths actually become larger, the path difference, this minus this, becomes smaller. Okay? And what is happening as this angle becomes larger is that, it's true, this is getting longer, but this is also getting longer, and this guy is getting longer at a faster rate. So the larger the angle of theta, the smaller this is. So that's one thing to remember, and that's, I mean, that, I'll guarantee that at least once in the next five years, you're going to be confused on that. Because it's just, it's opposite of what you would think. The second thing is that in here we have an N, and that's the refractive index inside. And the last thing, I'll make special emphasis, because I once missed this on a test, is that this angle here is the angle inside. Not the angle outside, it's the angle inside. Okay. Any questions on that? Pretty straightforward. I'll tell you, it's useful. It comes up all the time. Now, that's the path difference between these two arms. What we're really interested in is the phase difference between the two. And the phase difference is just 2 pi over lambda times the path difference, 2 pi over lambda, 2 nd cosine theta, plus we have to worry about any phase changes on reflection. And so we have some index here and a different index there, and let's say we have the same index down here that we have up there. One of these will be from a high index to a low index, and the other one will be from a low to a high, assuming this is the same index here as there. And so there's a phase difference here of plus or minus pi because of the phase change on reflection. So the actual phase difference has to include not only a 2 pi over lambda 2 nd cosine theta, but has to be a plus or minus pi here. Okay. And these fringes are localized at infinity. And again, we put in a lens and we look at them. And these fringes are the same, same type of fringes that you've seen before. And I show here a view graph that actually is not included in the set of view graphs that you have. But, I mean, these are the same circular fringes that we've seen so many times. There's no, no difference. And you can think of this, you know, you just, you have a point source here. After reflection off this surface and this surface, you have two point sources down here someplace. So you have the interference of two point sources. As this source moves around, these fringes will shift. And only when we go to infinity do the shin fringes not shift as we move the source around. So only at infinity will we see good contrast fringes from the extended source. And these same old circular fringes that we've seen many times before. And they, they give a name to this. These are sometimes called the fringes of equal inclination. I should write that down probably. Because for a given fringe, theta is a constant. So fringes of equal inclination or Heidinger fringes, what the other name is. Okay. So again, you know, these fringes, the, the radius will go as a square root of integers as we go out here. The spatial frequency will be proportional to the radius. Same, same results that we've had before. Okay. So that was reflected light. So plane parallel plate, extended source, reflected light, 6.1.2.2 will be transmitted light. Okay. Yeah.
And I don't, in your view graphs, you don't have this picture. So it's pretty simple to draw. So we just take the same thing, source up here. Now all the light, some of it will go straight through here. Some will be reflected here, up here, down here, and back again. So again, two surfaces are parallel. Um, for each ray going in, we're going to get two rays out. They're going to be parallel to one another, parallel to the input ray. We could go through the derivation for the path difference, but it's the same thing as what we had before when we looked at reflected light, same thing as 2nd cosine theta. Phase goes as 2 pi rho lambda, 2nd cosine theta. And the difference here is that this is reflected from whatever index this is to this index. This is reflected from whatever index this is to this index. And assuming we have the same index on both sides, you know, we may have a pi change, phase change here. I don't know. But if we have one there, we're going to have one here. And it will cancel out then. That would be 2 pi. And so the phase difference between the two interfering beams is just 2 pi over lambda 2 nd cosine theta. There's no plus or minus pi out here. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the light that we have in reflected here and the light we have in transmitted, the fringe patterns will be complements of one another. There's a 180 degree phase difference between the two. So when we get a bright fringe here, we'll get a dark fringe there, and vice versa. It also makes us happy maybe with conservation of energy, too. So the transmitted and reflected fringe patterns are complements of one another. The fringes are localized at infinity, from the old Van Sittert Zernike theorem. And the last thing is that we look here, the light going through, say this is a piece of glass, index of, oh, I forget, what's the normal index for glass? About one and a half, some number like that. The reflectance here, or at least at normal incidence, reflectance for index of one and a half is about, I forget, what's the number? Four percent, okay. So we get about four percent reflected here, about four percent reflected here. So we have about 92% there. We're getting 4% reflected there, another 4% reflected there. This other guy doesn't have much light, OK? We get low visibility fringes if we have low reflectivity here, OK? So these guys will not, the guys reflected up here will give us very high contrast fringes. The guys reflected down here will give us low contrast fringes. Now, I've kind of skipped something here a little bit in that we get light reflected from here up here and back down here and out. Some of this light here will be reflected back here and down here. Some of that will be reflected here and here. So we actually have many beams coming out of here. Now, if this is a low reflectivity, these higher order beams or higher reflectance beams don't have much light. We can kind of forget about them. As the reflectivity becomes larger and larger, then these other reflected beams are going to bother us. And that's why we're going to have a chapter 7 in this course, is to talk about these multiple reflected beams. So right now, we're just going to look at two beam interference. A little approximation. It's a very good approximation if we have 4% reflectivity on each surface. It's a terrible approximation if we have 94% reflectivity on each surface. But we'll take care of that in chapter 7. OK, so you must feel that you're an expert on plane parallel plates and fringes, both reflection, transmission, point sources, extended sources. Time to go on. OK, so we'll go on to section 6.2. And these will be called Fizeau fringes. And they are going to result from
from interference, we normally think of this uh, as resulting from interference occurring near a thin layer. And they're going to be very similar to what we had up above that we already have talked about. And I will bring out a, a little view graph for this too. And so these are not very new guys. They, I think they were first published in 1862. Um, but they're pretty useful guys, widely used guys. Point source, point source, where are the fringes localized? Always, regardless of the interferometer. The non-localized, right? They exist every place the two beams overlap. So now we're going to come down here, and at least for my drawing, I'm going to have a thin film here. And, um, you know, index, say, N, and each side is N1. And the light comes down here, and some of the light will be reflected off the top surface here, and some of the light will be reflected off the bottom surface. And so it looks just like what we covered. But the, the difference here is that the separation between these two surfaces, D, is going to be a function of position here. Okay? So I guess I say that down here. D, the film thickness, is a function of position. Furthermore, these surfaces are not flat. And so theta here, uh, theta was the angle um, to the normal inside here. Theta here, angle within the film, is also going to be a function of position. So the phase difference we can still write as 2 pi over lambda, 2 nd cosine theta, another equation you're going to dream about, plus or minus pi, just like we had before, except d and theta are a function of position. Okay. And that's all there is to that, except I, maybe I, I kind of didn't say something here. But this was section 6.2.1, point source. So that's about all we can say about Fizeau and point source. But fortunately, we have 6.2.2, .2, which will be extended source, or I call it broad source. Okay. And for that, I'm going to have another view graph. Similar. Again, this is in the notes. I always like to emphasize 1862. I keep reading where people keep reinventing these things. Okay, now we have an extended source. So I'm going to have two, um, I'll just show two sources here. And the light from one source goes like so. And the light from the other source, we just trace a couple of rays here, go like so. And everything intersects up here. Now, the problem we get into is that if I try to look at the fringes up here, what's going to happen is that these guys, the light over here, will see a different D, different separation, and a different theta in general from the, the light over here. So the, light, the fringes produced by these beams will probably be a different location than the fringes produced by the, they're not going to be in phase. And so I can get around that if I, instead of look up here, if I look down, if I focus my camera, my eye, down in this region right here, and I focus here, you know, and see the interference, well, all the light from the source here will see the same, certainly see the same D down there. Okay. And so the fringes are localized near the film. And again, we can kind of see that from the Van Sutter at Zernike, too, and where the rays would intersect. It's going to be down here. So when we're looking at Fizeau fringes, we always image, or the extended source anyway, we always would image near the film. And all the rays will see approximately, all the rays at any given region will see approximately the same D. We still have the problem that the thetas will be different for different points here. 
And the way we get around that is that we reduce the variations. Remember, it's a cosine of theta that we're interested in. We're going to reduce that if the camera up here has a small aperture. So that means that for any given region here, only rays for a small range of theta will make it through our, to our camera. And that's a little bit equivalent to taking an extended source and making the effective size of the source smaller by putting an aperture on the camera up here. So that reduces the thetas that will, that will be present for a given fringe area. And if we go to normal, near normal incidence, then the cosine of theta is approximately 1 for a moderate spread in theta. So what you normally do, you're looking at Fizeau fringes, A, you focus in the region of thin film, B, you use a small aperture, C, you try to use something near normal incidence. And then you're going to get nice contrast fringes. Okay. Any questions? Well, let's talk a little bit more about the Fizeau. And the Fizeau is widely used in optics shops. And I think right now I'm going to give you a commercial for the, uh, a course I'll be teaching this fall on optical testing. In the past, it's been only every um, two years. Now we're going to teach it every year. And I think we're going to teach it on TV this coming year, so you, those of you out in TV land can watch it. So I'll give you a, a three-minute, well, something like that, three-minute preview of optical testing. Okay. Well, one of the many instruments we talk about in optical testing is this Fizeau. And this Fizeau, well, you know, it was, it was invented a long time ago, 1862 or so. It's still widely used in optic shops. And they're very um, different products built using a Fizeau. And I'll start here, I'll talk about what I call the classical Fizeau. And so you have some source here. And you often have a, something here that's ground on one side and polished on the other. And so light comes down here and it looks like in a big extended source now because this is ground. And you put down here two surfaces that you want to compare. And they could be flat surfaces, they could be spherical surfaces, they could be aspheric, they could be whatever. But one of these is going to be your master, and the other one is a part you're testing. And we put the two surfaces, the master surface and the surface being tested close together, and we get Fizeau fringes. And we've arranged this so we're looking pretty much at normal incidence. And my eye or my camera is going to focus down here. And we're going to see nice contrast fringes, maybe something like that. And when these two surfaces match, these um, fringes will be straight and equally spaced. And if the two surfaces don't match, then D is going to vary, 2D cosine theta is going to vary, and the shape of the fringes will no longer be straight and no longer be equally spaced. And we might get two fringes that look, I'll just draw two fringes that look like this with some average spacing of S. And we know that for a given fringe, 2 nd cosine theta is equal to an integer number of wavelengths. And so in going from one fringe to the next fringe, 2 nd cosine theta will change by 1. Uh, normal incidence cosine theta is 1. And so from going to one fringe to the next fringe, the separation between the two surfaces will change by half a wave. And if I have a fringe here that wiggles a little bit, deviates from being straight by some amount delta as a function of position here, then I know that the surface height error at a given point here goes as delta, whatever deviation this is from where it should be, divided by the average fringe spacing, S, times half a wavelength. And so I can go along here and determine the errors in the fringe, uh, the errors in the surface height, by looking at how the fringe departs from being straight. And just use some little simple equation here, lambda over 2 times delta over s. And 
one more view graph on this is um, I'll look here where I have two surfaces. One is flat, and the other one has a little low spot in it. And I look at the Fizeau fringes between these two surfaces. And um, where the two surfaces are flat, I get nice, straight, equally spaced fringes. And where I have a low spot here, the fringe is no longer going to be straight. And the important thing is, remember, 2nd cosine theta is equal to m lambda. That for a given fringe, the separation between the two surfaces is a constant. D is a constant, okay? And so this fringe is going to have to move in the direction such that along this fringe, D is a constant. And if we think about this for a while, and if I put a little wedge between the two surfaces, and the angle of this wedge is greater than any slope errors, and so the optical path difference uh, always is going to increase as they go to the right here. When I come to this little hole here, this fringe is going to have to move towards the thin portion of the wedge in order to have this condition that the separation, for a given fringe, the separation between the two surfaces is a constant. Or if I had a bump on this surface, now the fringe will have to move towards the open portion of the wedge. So this, the use of Fizeau fringes for measurement of optical surfaces, machine surfaces, all types of surfaces, measuring how flat they are, is, is very powerful. And, uh, and these techniques are not new at all. But the real thing that is, makes, a, say, a Fizeau interferometer so popular nowadays is that you combine this with modern electronics and a computer and software and it's amazing what you can measure and what you can determine about surfaces and so on. So anyway, that's my commercial for Optics 513 optical testing. Can I sell anyone on it? It's going to be at 8 a.m., I should warn you. <laughs> Unless we can, I'm trying to get it changed to 7, but I haven't succeeded yet. Okay. 6.2.3. That's still under Fuzzo. But it's going to have a little different name. Newton's rings. And this is really just a, a famous example of Fuzzo fringes. And I'll again go to a, a drawing. So what we have here is, uh, I'll cover up the answer. Um, we have a flap, and we have a spherical surface here. Long radius of curvature, R. And so, if I go out here from the center, a distance rho, the separation between the two surfaces is D. And um, so this distance here is R. And since that's a sphere, this distance here is R. And so I would have here that um, R squared plus rho squared Um, is approximately equal to this distance here, which is r plus d squared. And so um, I'm taking d as a, a vertical distance here, and I'm just saying the angle here is small enough that I can just extend this along here and call that d. And so that's what r squared plus 2dr plus d squared. d is small, goes to 0. And so we have the result here that d 
is approximately equal to rho squared over 2r. The result you've seen many times before. Just We're approximating the spherical surface as a parabolic surface. And so if I go out to the, um, well, let's look here at the center. I'm going to go out to some fringes, but I have to look here at the center first. Right at the center, these two guys are in contact, okay? And so what can you say about the fringe right at the center? I'll slide this down here. So maybe it doesn't quite say that, but it, the center fringe is a dark fringe. And it's a dark fringe. Well, you can think of two reasons why it might be a dark fringe. If these two surfaces really are contacting, if I had them in optical contact, there would be no light reflected up here. Therefore, it must be a dark fringe. Okay. The other thing is that, let's say I have just a teeny weeny little bit of separation here. Very, very small fraction of a wavelength of separation. One of these reflected beams would be from a high index to a low, and next would be low to a high, so that would be 180 degrees out of phase. So that's another way of thinking. The center guy is going to be a dark fringe. Okay. So if I go out here, I'll, well, slide this up here for the time being. For the nth dark fringe from the center, d sub m, well, the path difference is going to be, what, an integer number of wavelengths. But we go through this little separation here twice. So d sub m is an integer number of half waves. Okay. And so we would have here that rho sub m squared, the radius of the mth dark fringe from the center, divided by 2r is approximately equal to m lambda over 2. I'll come back to the drawing in a second. Or rho sub m, radius of the mth dark fringe, is m lambda r. So we get the same old circular fringes that we've seen so many times. The radius here goes as a square root of integers. Oops. Okay. If I can find uh, and I probably can't find the fringes when I want them. I hear they are. So it's going to be the same, the fringes are going to look the same as what we had before. And the radius will go as the nth, uh, as the square root of the integer. Okay. One other thing we could say here. Um, can we say anything about the area? between fringes. So area goes as pi r squared. So area for mth fringe pi rho sub m squared pi m lambda r. m plus 1 fringe pi m plus 1 lambda r. Area difference here, pi rho squared m plus 1 minus pi rho squared m is pi lambda r. So the area between fringes is constant to within the approximations we've gone through here.
So the area of each one of these fringe is a constant. Okay. So anyway, that's the uh, Newton's rings. Any questions on that? Experts on Newton's rings? So who discovered Newton's rings? Fizeau. <laughs> Might be, I don't know. Okay, 6.2.4. Soap bubbles and oil films. Well, this was a perfect time with all the rain we had this week. Something like this. Soap bubbles and oil films. Well, they're nothing but fuzzo fringes, okay? I'll go to my little little view graph on this. So the equation we want, same old guy. I tell you, the, this is one equation you have to memorize. You have to dream about it, OK? 2 pi over lambda, 2 nd cosine theta plus pi is m times 2 pi for a great fringe. The thing about oil films and um, soap bubbles like that is that well, let's say here, D, if D is many wavelengths, M is going to vary greatly as we change the wavelength. Okay? So a very small change in wavelength, if D is large, all the different wavelengths are going to get out of step, and we're not going to see many fringes, or if any fringes. But the interesting thing about soap bubbles and oil films is that D is small. D is a few wavelengths. Now M here is going to vary slowly with lambda. Therefore, with thin films, we're going to see color fringes. And the color is going to change with variations in thickness in theta. And uh, I mean, if you just, if you say you're looking at an oil slick on the road, and you change your angle of viewing it, you can see the color changes. Color changes because theta changes. Okay? As theta becomes larger, cosine theta becomes smaller, and this, this OPD becomes less. So it's because these thicknesses are so small that we will see all these pretty colors because the M does very, very slowly with wavelength. And the fringes will not wash out. We end up with some very, very pretty colors. So you're an expert now in soap bubbles and oil films. Okay, that's all there is to it. Next topic. Next topic is going to take a while. And I uh, guess we have about five minutes left. The clock on the wall is a little, a little misleading here. Uh, this is the official clock right there in front of me here. Um, 6.3. The Michelson two-beam interferometer. Jeez, you already had a homework problem on this, didn't you? A little bit. I think I got a little bit ahead of myself in that homework problem. But they gave you a good chance to go to the books and look up the Michelson, right? Um, not sure exactly what I did on that. But in any case, maybe you're already experts. You, you studied Michelson in, I think, kindergarten they studied Michelson interferometer. Anyway, we're, this is a Michelson's two-beam interferometer, not to be confused with his stellar interferometer. And uh, it's, uh, we already, when we studied the plane parallel plate, we're really, it's very similar in many ways. So we're going to start off here, we're going to use an extended source. Can you see Dr. Wyatt? Yes? We have less time than I thought. Okay. <laughs> so which clock is right and how much time do we have? We have like a minute. 
Like a minute? Okay, it says four minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think we're going to come back and talk about the Michelson 2 beam interferometer on Thursday. And um, we'll go through it, and we'll spend a fair amount of time on it. It's a really interesting interferometer, and uh, it'll work out very neatly. So I will see you bright and early Thursday morning.